get back at it with the Les Paul Jr. You'll recall that when I pulled out the tone pot, I managed to read the date code, and it was made in early April of 1955. So we can assume this was made in that year, or maybe early 1956. After putting some black on the headstock, I went ahead and sprayed four or five coats of lacquer, clear lacquer. This veneer that I used isn't quite as closed pour as the black dyed pear wood I'm used to using. They were out of it the last time I went shopping. So I'm not sure what species this is, but you can see that after it's shrunk back there is some slight texture there. So I'm going to have to give this a preliminary flat sanding with some 1200 grit paper before I put the decals on. I want a good smooth flat surface. 600 grit might be a little too coarse and the scratches can sometimes show up um, in subsequent coats of lacquer. So I'm using 1200 grit which uh, takes a bit more elbow grease but better safe than sorry. Frequently dusting off my paper. I do this dry. I started doing it dry some time ago and I don't quite know why but I like it better. Um, ordinarily this wet dry sandpaper you would soak for some hours before use and then keep the surface wet. The main thing is to get rid of any little crumbs of finish that get picked up and stick to the paper. If the surface isn't absolutely flat and perfectly mirror shiny when I'm done, I'm not going to be too critical. Given that the, this is on the guitar that it's on and the fact that it, you know it's almost 70 years old. Um, it should at this point have a bunch of scratches, bumps and bruises and places where people weren't careful with the strings and you know carved little circles into the finish. Bumps and bruises. A little while back I posted on Instagram asking people if they knew where to get really high quality Gibson headstock decals or decals depending on an area you grew up in. Uh, opinions were mixed. You can find lots of them online in places like Etsy and eBay, but they almost all seem to be made from the same set of files, like mimicking something from the 70s, like uh, an inlay rather than a decal, and even then they're wrong. You know, the fidelity isn't great. The other thing is, during the 50s, the logo actually changed design slightly, at least once. Things like the dot over the eye started to get, you know, it started off detached from the G and eventually melded with it. Um, also the attachment strokes between the letters were more free-flowing and thinner. So I looked at a bunch of headstocks online and uh, kind of got familiar with what it should look like before I bought. Actually, I have a few real-world examples, so let's have a look at them. That post also got me into a little bit of a debate whether Gibson actually used decals or if they were always screen printed or pad printed, some other transfer method to put uh, ink or lacquer onto the surface. Here is a Gibson SJ from 1946, a Southern Jumbo. You can see the lettering used in this era is kind of broader, um, very friendly looking, enthusiastic brush script. It's kind of nice. But just looking at the surface here, it doesn't look to me like this is a decal. The letters themselves are very slightly raised, but it's not around the letter, it is right on the letter. So I imagine this was probably screen printed. Now here's an LG from the early 50s, I believe 1952, same thing. You can see on the leading edge of that G, there is a reflection showing how it's thicker than the surroundings. This seems to be screen print. It could be sprayed through a frisket or a stencil, but I don't think so. Now here's one that's much closer in age to the one we're working on. This is a 1957, uh, just a year later, and it's an LGO. See this slightly white ghosting effect around the letters? That is very definitely a decal. The other thing is, the letters themselves are not raised above the plane of the headstock, but there is a slight discrepancy where the edge of the decal is. 
So that's interesting that they may have changed their procedure at some point in the 50s. I've also seen actual new old stock logo repair decals that at one point Gibson would send out to their warranty repair shops. I don't believe they do that anymore. Uh, this was on Reverb. They were asking a pretty penny for them. They're pretty expensive. But I'm not sure I'd want to use a 50-year-old decal. My model airplane building days taught me that, you know, they can get pretty fragile over time and behave in some strange ways. Like if the coating on top of the decal has cracked due to age, the water will get in there and they'll bubble in strange ways. So, no, I want something new. Took some tracking down, but I finally found a decent reproduction of the earlier 1950s logo at crocsguitars.com. That's C-R-O-X. He's in the UK. These are not cheap, but they're good. Uh, they're tested and suitable for being coated with lacquer, which isn't always the case. Um, some of these things you shoot a coat on and the printing just sort of dissolves. And these have been printed with real metallic ink. You know, the ones you buy for $6 on Etsy, odds are they're going to look weird. So, you know, I'm going to put these on. Decals are printed on extremely thin film, which is stuck to a backing paper. And then a clear coat is sprayed over top to preserve the image. You get to cut out around it. Uh, I'm using a very fresh scalpel blade here and taking great care. Trying to figure out the positioning here. I've got a photo of a 50s Les Paul for reference. It's printed in negative to save on ink. The decal gets floated onto some warm, but not hot, water for about 30 to 45 seconds. It gets dropped into position and the backing paper slides out, and you have a brief moment or two in which you can reposition it on the surface, get rid of any wrinkles, and then you pat it lightly with a tissue. Then you leave it alone. I didn't leave it alone, as you'll see. Gibson goes on in much the same way. A pair of tweezers helps in pulling out the backing. It's so thin and delicate, it's really hard to describe. Unless you've tried this, you won't know. Notice how the Les Paul signature disappeared? It kind of had to. Alright, you want to hear a good one? I put the Les Paul on, and it was going fine, as you saw. But... On second look, it seemed a little bit far down towards the truss rod, um, which might have been an optical illusion, but it's also because these tuner holes here are actually positioned a little bit higher towards the top of the uh, headstock than in the original. Anyway, I thought I had enough time to reposition it, and I slid it up, but a wrinkle developed. And I was heard to say, oh, fiddlesticks as it tore in two. Yeah, it was munched. And I believe this could only happen because in my mind there was the knowledge that a second set of decals was on the way. There was like a mulligan waiting in the wings. Several days later now, I've got a new envelope in hand with new decals. I've put some tape on here very lightly after sticking it to my shirt um, with a little line there for reference. And I'm going to go about this very casually. Like, what's the big deal? Um, in truth, these are fairly large decals versus what you find on your average model airplane. And they're so thin in relation to their area that there's not much resistance to surface tension. Like, you can't move these a whole lot. It helps to, you know, wet the surface a little bit, but even then, once it's down, it's down. So, I just have to remember that the loop of the L goes here and... The junior has to line up somewhere kind of in between the O and the S, like so. And it'll look relatively centered, and uh, it'll be okay. It'll be fine. And of course, there were people on that previous video suggesting that, well, do you not notice that this headstock is not perfectly bilaterally symmetrical? And of course I know that, yes, yes, it is a little bit weird. It was carved by somebody else probably by hand. It's not that easy to do if you don't have a routing template for it. Um, but it's close enough and it looks okay with uh, tuners on and everything, so we're going to go with it. Back to historical examples. 
some things to compare. First of all, I'm not alone in having problems installing the decals. And I'm really out of practice. I haven't put together a model in years. Most of the junior examples from the 1950s, even the ones in really good shape today, tend to be missing little chunks of the lettering. The pink arrow in the first headstock shows the looped tail of the L, just didn't want to join the party. And the second, well, the signature part seems to be a lot more fugitive or prone to going away than the more robust letters of the top logo. Also note the position of the decal relative to the top tuner posts. That was what disconcerted me. I was too low. It looked like it was from the 70s or after, when things moved down towards the truss rod cover plate. I believe it was Aristophanes, probably in Lysistrata, who said, Ain't nothing to it but to do it, homie. Before putting clear coats on top, I'm going to lightly sand with 1200 again, focusing on the edges of the decals, trying to thin them out a little bit and blend them. Even though they're thin as a hair, or even less, it eventually transfers as a height difference in the layers of lacquer, and you kind of see it. Okay, let's recap. As much for me as for you, because it's been several weeks to get to this point. I started off with a piece of black dyed veneer on the bottom, over which I shot two coats of black lacquer, then three coats of clear lacquer. I let that sit for a few days, sanded it more or less flat. Then I installed the decals. Then I shot four more coats of clear, sanded that level, then shot two more. That is 11 coats in total. It's been sitting for nine days at this point, and I think I'm ready to do the final leveling and polishing. Now realize, these finishing schedules I work with in these videos for repair, they differ from what I do in a guitar that I was building from scratch. In repair, we're always dealing with differential shrinkage between new and old finishes. On a new guitar, you spray over everything, and the whole layer kind of as one. It, it cures about the same rate contracts more or less equally over the whole guitar. In repairs, you're usually putting a thick layer on some areas and a thin layer over top of previously cured finish, which isn't going to shrink. It's done shrinking, basically. So you get hills and valleys that you have to deal with if you want a truly flat mirror finish when you're done. And in order to equalize them, you have to wait a very long time before leveling and buffing. Even then, it doesn't always end up perfect. Witness lines usually appear somewhere down the road. You can see that around the decals. These were gossamer thin, remember? The day after I sprayed, this looked perfectly flat. Now they're thrown into relief. So I'm going to sand the finish that is sitting on top of them down to the level of the surrounding stuff. And yes, that's very nerve-wracking. Next year you'll probably see a faint line around them again, just like in the vintage examples. Again, I'm block sanding with 1200 grit. I'm doing it dry. Remember, in this case I'm not going for absolute perfection in terms of gloss or finish quality, you know. This is a beat up old guitar. I mean, I'm not going to do a full scale relicking job either. I think time will take care of that for us. I'm just getting rid of some of the little bumps and dips in sinkage. People sometimes ask, how do you do the kind of relicking thing to make something look old and basically a forgery? And I mean, my response is, you better know how to look. Like, you can't really set up a formula. You've got to just sort of look at a whole bunch of really old guitars, internalize what you're seeing, and then find a way to do that. Um, Otherwise, it always looks too formulaic. Okay, to buff this up, I'm going to use some Mother's California Gold Ultimate Wax System Pure Polish Number 1. So that's like the most aggressive. Doesn't really matter the brand. Soft cotton cloth. Little circular motions. I could stop at any time here. 
because this looks shiny enough for a 65 year old Les Paul. As opposed to standard practice, I'm going to pay careful attention to the edges. Usually you sort of stay away from them because the lacquer is thin there and you don't want to rub through. However, in this case, if I rub through, that might not be a bad thing. Okay, that already looks almost too shiny. I'm just going to rub with my fingertips in kind of a random pattern. Yeah, I'll call that done. Mid 50s Gibson frets tend to be fairly small by modern standards. You can measure that. These are probably around 80 thousandths wide, maybe a little less. By, they probably started around 25 to 30 thousandths tall. These guys are just around 20 at the moment. Um, Les liked them quite low for that super fast fancy picking he did where he was constantly shifting his hand position up and down the neck. A lot of jumping between octaves. So, you know, with that said, there's not often a lot of material to dress if you want to level them. These ones, they have moderate wear. They may have been dressed at least once. Another thing about old Gibsons is they didn't spend a lot of time recrowning the frets in the factory after dressing them. And they just ran the file or the stone over the tops, and so they tend to be kind of flat. They just rub some sandpaper up and down the board to kind of knock off the sharp corners and just let it be. That would be unthinkable to a lot of modern makers and players. Standards have really changed when it comes to fret shaping. As they wear, the takeoff point for the string tends to move either forward toward the nut or towards the bridge, depending on which way you play. And on a fret that's 80 thousandths or 2 millimeters wide, that can mean your actual fret position is a 32nd of an inch or almost a millimeter away from its theoretical ideal in the center of the fret. Add on to that the non-adjustable nature of the old wraparound tailpieces on these things. Intonation becomes more or less approximate, especially as you go up the neck. So. Recrowning these things isn't just for aesthetics. It should play more in tune when I get done with it. And rather than try and dress these little inconsistencies out of the fret top, what I do is recrown the sides, pushing those flat areas inwards towards the center of the fret and its theoretical ideal in terms of placement. This first fret was likely replaced at some point. You can see there's a difference in the way the ends are treated. Also, different crowning, and um, actually, it oxidizes in a different way. It's slightly more yellow than the other frets. This is one of those jobs where I don't know how you would do it if you weren't using a three-cornered file, the traditional style. I mean, nothing against Eric Coleman or Stu Mac and the Z files or any of the other. Um, purpose-built crowning files, but none of them work on a fret that's only 25 thousandths high. <laughs> These bushings need to be a pretty snug fit, and this is another job that might be done with an arbor press. I don't have one of those. I have this little screw thing. This is a um, quarter twenty threaded machine screw. A little backing plate here which is padded with cork, and uh, just pop that in there, and I put in one of these knobs. It's got a through bore, also quarter twenty, of course. And that just applies a nice, even pressure, so they don't go in cockeyed or anything. Let us put on a new bridge. The old one here will be saved in the case for people of the future to look at. Perhaps it will become a children's toy. Or maybe it will be melted down to retrieve its rare and necessary resources 
for a ship to escape the planet. People want to know how intonation is possible with a bridge that looks like this, and the answer is, of course, it's rudimentary. Um, but that might be all you need for rock and roll. Remember, this is ostensibly a kid's guitar. I'm sure Les Paul probably glanced at them when he was walking through the factory, but odds are he never really played music on one. Uh, in 1954, most guitars in the world had saddles with immovable intonation points. Unless it was a Telecaster, or maybe you got one of the very first Strats, they weren't even back-filing the B-string on acoustic saddles at that point. Tuning was done by ear, and intonation was something that, you know, you would not adjust. It came with the guitar, that was it. These days, people are more discerning. This is a replacement from Music City. They call it the Stud Finder. Um, this is designed to compensate more accurately than the original. It's a $150 item. Um, if you're in Canada, don't choose anything besides U.S. Postal Service package delivery, because, well, this is something that's been a real issue in recent years. The added fees companies like FedEx or UPS or DHL add for customs brokering on a little guitar part, I paid an extra 70 bucks on this. It's a heck of a scheme. The main thing to remember is this is an aluminum alloy, aluminium to friends in the UK, and in it there are set screws, which happen to be steel. If you make the mistake of trying to adjust this with the string tension on it, you're going to be very disappointed in yourself because the threads will get mashed up and stripped out and it will just not function. So you have to detune completely while getting the intonation set up. Okay, I think we're going to call that for now. I'm very happy with the headstock. Looks good to me. The new bridge intonates fantastically well. You just put it on there, set the outside ease, and all the other strings are right on. I'm probably going to end up doing some more work on this guitar. The P90 is not a quiet pickup, but this one is buzzy in ways that makes me kind of suspect the volume pot, which has quite a lot of solder on it. Um, you'll recall I had to replace the tone. We now have a functioning tone control, of course. It does everything you want it to. Uh, it also changes the volume slightly as well. It's got that classic effect with the 50s design. Um, if you make it darker, the volume dips a bit. A treble bleed cap setup would probably help that, although you can get used to it and work with it, actually. I want the owner to play it for a bit and see what he thinks. For me, the frets, ugh, not great. I mean, they're too low. There are places in the board that could use a bit of a fret dress, but there's just really not enough material there to do that. This is another one that illustrates how buying an old vintage guitar with a number of obvious issues, well, those can be disguising others that won't make themselves known until you fix the first ones. It's hard to find a genuine bargain, and a lot of these require a lot of work. And they can be as frustrating as they are fun sometimes. They're not unlike old cars that way. Anyway, I'll plug in, and I'll play a little bit gently because it's late, and I don't want to wake up the neighbor's baby. <laughs> 